Hello all, I am Fadila Shaib speaking to you from WHO headquarters in Geneva and welcoming you all to our global COVID-19 press conference today, Friday, 5th February. Um, we have simultaneous interpre interpretation in the six UN languages plus Portuguese and Hindi. Uh, I would like to introduce to, to you the WHO participant. Uh, present in the room are who, the WHO Director General Dr. Tedros, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, Health Emergencies, Dr. Maria von Kerkhoff, Technical Lead for COVID-19, Dr. Maria Angela Simao, Assistant Director General, Access to Medicines and Health Products, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, Dr. Bruce Elward, Special Advisor to DG and Lead on Act Accelerator, Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director, Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals. Welcome all. Now, without further delay, I would like to hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Fadila. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Earlier this week, Captain Sir Tom Moore died with COVID-19. As you know, as he approached his 100th birthday last year, Captain Sir Tom decided he would try to raise £1,000 for the United Kingdom's National Health Services by completing 100 laps of his garden. He ended up raising more than £30 million. For me, Captain Sir Tom represents two things. The first is that everyone can make a difference, whether that's raising money, inspiring others, informing the public, or simply deciding to stay at home to keep others safe. The second is that Captain Sir Tom was a reminder of the value we should put on older people and everything they bring to our world. However, there is a disturbing narrative in some countries that it's okay if older people die. It's not okay. No one is dispensable. Every life is precious, regardless of age, gender, income, legal status, ethnicity, or anything else. And that's why it's so important that older people everywhere are pro prioritized for vaccination. Those most at risk of severe disease and death from COVID-19, including health workers and older people, must come first. And they must come first everywhere. Globally, the number of vaccinations has now overtaken the number of reported infections. In one sense, that's good news and a remarkable achievement in such a short time frame. But more than three quarters of those vaccinations are in just 10 countries that account for almost 60 percent of global GDP. Almost 130 countries with 2.5 billion people are yet to administer a single dose. Some countries have already vaccinated large proportions of their population who are at lower risk of severe disease or death. All governments have an obligation to protect their own people. But once countries with vaccines have vaccinated their own health workers and older people, the best way to protect the rest of their own population is to share vaccines so other countries can do the same. That's because the longer it takes to vaccinate those most at risk everywhere, the more opportunity we give the virus to mutate and evade vaccines. In other words, unless we suppress the virus everywhere, we could end up back at square one. On Wednesday, COVAX published its forecast for the distribution of vaccines to participating countries. This is a very exciting moment. 
countries are ready to go, but the vaccines aren't there. We need countries to share doses once they have finished vaccinating health workers and older people. But we also need a massive scale-up in production. Last week, Sanofi announced it would make its manufacturing infrastructure available to support production of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. We call on other companies to follow this example. Companies can also issue non-exclusive licenses to allow other producers to manufacture their vaccine, a mechanism that has been used before to expand access to treatments for HIV and hepatitis C. The COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, or CTAP, enables the voluntary licensing of technologies in a non-exclusive and transparent way by providing a platform for developers to share knowledge, intellectual property, and data. This sharing of knowledge and data could enable immediate use of untapped production capacity and help build additional manufacturing bases, especially in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Expanding production globally would also make poor countries less dependent on their donations from rich ones. These are unprecedented times, and we applaud those manufacturers that have pledged, for example, to sell their vaccines at cost. But manufacturers can do more. Having received substantial public funding, we encourage all manufacturers to share their data and technology to ensure global equitable access to vaccines. And we call on companies to share their dossiers with WHO faster and more fully than they have been doing so we can review them for emergency use listing. Last Friday, we heard from health workers in Uganda and Pakistan who are waiting to be vaccinated. Today, we are pleased to be joined by two health workers from high-income countries who have been vaccinated. First, I would like to introduce Professor Gabriel Gold, who works in a geriatric department at the Troishan Hospital here in Geneva. Professor Gold, thank you for joining us. Please share with us your experience during the pandemic and your hopes for your work and indeed the world now you have been vaccinated. You have the floor. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I must say that uh, vaccination for me was a, a huge relief. Uh, you, you mentioned the case of a centenarian who did so much and unfortunately uh, suffered from the disease. It's important to remember that the sickest people with COVID-19 are very often the oldest and the most frail. I work in a hospital that has provided acute care to people with COVID-19, perhaps over 600 patients uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. These people deserve top quality care for their COVID disease, but they also require a lot of help with other comorbid diseases, but most importantly, sometimes with very simple things. It can be uh, helping them sit up in bed it can be helping them wash their face or brush their teeth or, or, or taking a sip of water. It, it can be just a reassuring presence because sometimes they may be lost or confused because they are so sick in un unknown surroundings. This means that there is a very close proximity when taking care of such patients between patients who have a very serious and infectious disease and healthcare workers. And of course, we use protection, whatever we need, the protective clothing and, and barriers and masks. Uh, but the vaccine is really a key way to prevent uh, the spread of the disease. And of course, this is something that we worry about because we also have many other patients in the hospital who came in for other reasons who don't have COVID-19 
and we want them to be able to go home without COVID-19. So we want to make sure that we do not transmit this to them. It also reassures us when we go home and we have our families, close ones, because we want to be careful too about transmitting the disease there. And vaccination is also a, an opportunity for health authorities to recognize the, the immense dedication that healthcare workers all over the world have put in to provide care for people with uh, uh, COVID-19. Long hours uh, for going vacation, month after month and probably for many months to come, uh, the health workers are there as long as they are healthy. And vaccination is a way for healthcare authorities to first show their appreciation of these healthcare workers, but also their understanding that if you want to provide care to people who really are very sick and need it, you need trained healthcare personnel. They have to be healthy, and vaccination is an important way to deal with that. Vaccination enhances the motivation of people who have worked very hard and need to continue to work very hard to deal with this terrible pandemic. The pandemic occurs all over the world. People are getting sick all over the world. People need healthcare workers all over the world. They need healthy healthcare workers all over the world. So we should vaccinate those people who are at risk so that we don't fill the hospitals and the care centers with as many patients. And we need to vaccinate, of course, wherever they are all over the world, healthcare workers who are providing this care. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Professor Gold. Thank you so Merci. much, and I welcome your support to accelerate vaccine rollout globally. Now to our second guest, Cindy Fraz. Cindy Fraz is a mental health specialist nurse at the Hospital Clinic of Barcelona. Cindy, we look forward to hearing about your experience working on mental health during the pandemic and what it has been like for you to be vaccinated. You have the floor, Cindy. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good night around the world. Uh, my name is Cindy Frias, and I'm a mental health specialist nurse. And I'm a mental health nurse at Hospital Clinic of Barcelona, at the Child Psychiatry Unit. And today I'm here to explain my experience in this pandemic situation and, and uh, all the vaccination process. So, I went to this public uh, health emergency, uh, Spanish hospital, and especially my, my hospital, the hospital clinic, uh, had, had to adapt you know, a, a lot of measures to that, that include the adaptation, reorganization of clinical care units, uh, hospitalization units, and even uh, psychiatry units. You know. um, all this change you know, was a uh, pressure and challenges for the nurse and all the uh, uh, healthcare workers. You know. um, this experience and this current pandemic has caused an important impact on our emotional well-being you know, uh, from the beginning and until now because of, for the unexpected you know, outbreak of the situation and the high rate of transmission. You know. Likewise, uh, the increase of activity, like the lack of staff the, especially the nursing staff, you know, led to an increase of our working hours every day. And that represented an important increase of stressor you know, for us. Even now, I'm, I'm suffering this, these circumstances. You know. um, for the other hand, you know, regarding to the direct contact with, with our patient, you know, uh, the, the measures um, uh, and the, the, the nurse had had to, to reduce you know the or limit the nursing care you know? the, 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 the nurse has had to reduce the time left in, in, in every uh, uh, visit to the inside the, the patient rooms you no know? we, we, we have had to, to, to use personal protective equipment you no know? uh, for protection and maybe this measure has caused in, in our in, 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 in the nurse, no, and to express 
the feelings of fear, anger, and the uh, sensation of less humanized uh, care, you know, and, and lower quality of care. Uh, added to this situation, you know, uh, the hospital restricted or limited the family visits and the outside patient walks, you know, and for that reason, uh, uh, that measures affected the emotional well-being uh, patient, you know, the patient emotional well-being and the family too. Uh, uh, however, I think it's very important to highlight, you know, the, 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 the adaptability, you know, the cope of, of all the nurse and the old uh, healthcare workers, you know, the resilience, you know, the capacity of uh, individuals to bounce back or cope in this new situation, you know, despite adverse circumstances. And, and, and can be the resilience and the capacity of adaptation of this health situation. You know, it's important to can be under, uh, understood uh, as a process, you know, the positive ad ad adaptation you know, uh, to a stress and adversity. You know. uh, in my case, uh, I think uh, I also adapt you know, to the situation as most, as most, most people no, um, or as most my, my co-workers, but I I have felt fear and anxiety because, for example, I I, I have a, a three years old son and I live with my mom and, and I have especially been afraid of of infecting them, you no, know? and and I have to come to work every day, you know, and for that reason I think I, I was feeling. Uh, that, that that sensation or negative thoughts every day, you know. Uh, uh, around the world, you no, know, a lot of nurses have been infected, you no, know, and many of them have have died, and a lot of a lot of them uh, are, were young. For example, I, w I would I would like to share with with you the, my 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 own experience because my own died. Uh, in August from coronavirus disease, and she was a nurse, you no? Know? She was an extraordinary nurse, and she was only 51 years old, you no? Know? Uh, in fact, I'm a, I'm, I'm a nurse f f f for her, because she was my role model, and she was, repeat, an excellent nurse, and I always remember her as the best nurse uh, um, in the in the in the whole world, no, and she became and she she infected while she was working, no, and she died quickly because she had a uh, comorbidity, and she died a few weeks after the infection. Uh, she was uh, a fact a situation very very deep for me, and obviously this loss increased my fear, my anguish, my anxiety especially my mom, no? Therefore, I, I leave this uh, vaccination process uh, like, a, like a great, a, a great uh, change, no? The uh, uh, enormous scientific advances in relation uh, for my, my work, no? And, and I think it's fundamental, no? I received the COVID vaccine. I received the first dose on January 9th and the second on January 13th. And I, I, I haven't had any side effects, just a local pain in the arm. But uh, some, some, uh, some co-workers have experienced some side effects, no? side, minor side, side effects. No. Anyway, I have lived the vaccination experience as a lie, a lie of hope, a lie uh, on the road. I, I don't know if this is the right uh, uh, explication no? or, or the, the, the right. Uh, I, I had a, I, uh, I, I did a, a, a translation you know, of my, my feelings. You know? and, and I see the process as reliable considering some negative effects, no? But, but, uh, but I think uh, uh, the, the, the vaccination process 
is uh, is uh, is is hope, no? Is is hope, is faith in the healthcare system, and and I think it's vital that health healthcare workers around the world are vaccinated because we need to do our work uh, with, with 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 security, no? With with confidence, and we need. Uh, to we need to confident with the healthcare system. No, uh, my family are, are are very happy. Mm? My mom is happier for me, and my family is happy and, and hopeful for the future. And and see the vaccination. No, the the, the vaccination process, the, the COVID vaccine as uh, something, something safe, no, close, and maybe uh, as a tangible fact, no? And, and I think the most of my coworkers see the vaccination process as something very pos positive, no, for us. And, and I think is, uh, we need, no, we need this vaccine for all the uh, health care workers around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, muchas gracias. We know many people have felt isolated during the pandemic and the work you do as a mental health nurse specialist is so critical. Thank you once again to both our guests today. We're glad both of you have been vaccinated and are able to keep doing your essential work. And thank you to both of you for the clear call you have issued for health workers everywhere to be vaccinated. Fadila, back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tedros, and to our uh, guests. Uh, I will now open the floor to a question from journalists, uh, reminding you that you need to raise your hand using the raise your hand icon in order to get in the queue. Um, first a question goes to uh, Soko from NSK. Soko, can you hear me? Hi, Frida, can you hear me? Yes, uh, very well. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. So, uh, COVAX announced two days ago its interim distribution forecast for the first half of the year, predicting its distribution to 145 economies. I do understand COVAX prioritizes, first of all, countries which aren't able to buy doses by themselves. On the other hand, I see some of the richest countries, such as Canada, is expecting to receive doses in the first half of the year. I'm not trying to blame any specific country for receiving doses, but why doesn't COVAX prioritize the economies which need doses the most? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Soko. Dr. Swaminathan? Yes, thank you very much for that question. Uh, as you know, COVAX was set up as a uh, mechanism to provide uh, equity in vaccine distribution across countries of all types, high income, middle income, low income. It wasn't uh, meant to only serve low income countries. And as you know, there are two types of uh, countries participating in COVAX, the self-financing countries, which uh, pay in advance, make an advance uh, commitment and then pay for the vaccines and then the AMC countries, 92 of them, that get you know, very subsidized um, or free vaccine. So it was also not clear at the beginning when the mechanism was designed that there would be so many bilateral deals. So the idea was that there should be a global mechanism that is able to procure at the best possible price, have access to the widest range of vaccine candidates, and then be able to distribute them globally based on the fair allocation mechanism that we set up, WHO set up with, uh, with partners. Um, over the last few months, of course, things changed and many countries went ahead and, and did bilateral deals and have their own supplies, but the COVAX facility is not going to penalize countries for doing that. However, in the first wave of allocations, we are looking at you know, whether countries have started vaccinating already or not. And those countries, the DG mentioned 130 countries have not you know, got a single dose of vaccine. So there is a prioritization, particularly for the early doses that are being shipped out in February and March for, for countries which do not have any vaccines at all. There's also the option for countries to opt out. So countries that have uh, got vaccines through other sources, 
um, can opt out at any time of receiving so that those doses can then be reallocated to the other countries which you know, may not have access to, to anything. So it was set up to be a very fair mechanism. Things have changed over the last uh, few months, uh, but we still you know, want to stick to the original principles that we based it on. Thank you. I don't know if Dr. Aylward or Samao want to come in. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I would like now to invite Helen Branswell from STAT to ask the next question. Helen, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hello to you all. Um, during uh, your opening remarks this morning, Dr. Tedros, you mentioned that uh, the WHO would like countries, or not countries, excuse me, companies to start sharing their dossiers faster to get emergency listings through WHO. Can you give us a sense of who has done it and who isn't um, coming to WHO to get an emergency listing fast enough? Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Dr. Simao will take this question. Thank you, Helen. That, that's a very good question. And the call is, the WHO has launched the, what we call an expression of interest for, for companies to, to submit their dossiers, phase 2B and phase 3 only, to WHO. October last year, we received 13, 15 submissions, 13 uh, that were considered eligible. We, we do have uh, issued one, which was the Pfizer, and we have four vaccine candidates in very advanced stage. And this, this, the, what I'm going to tell you now is public. You can find it on WHO's website. It's updated weekly. The stage of the assessment of each of these vaccine candidates is on WHO's website. So we have at a very advanced stage already the uh, two Chinese manufacturers, Sinopharm and Sinovac. We have a, 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 a team of inspectors in China since the second week of January. They're waiting the quarantine to finish, and they will start inspections next week. We have uh, two vaccines that we will, should have a decision on the 15th of, of January, which are two AZ-derived vaccines. One is the Serum Institute of India, and the other one is the SK Bio in Korea, which are vaccine producers that will provide to the COVAX facility. So we'll have a decision now. Uh, what we, we want is that those vaccines, that those, those vaccine manufacturers that have more advanced vaccine candidates finalizing phase 2B or phase 3 tries to come to the, to, to the WHO uh, emergency use listing. And why is this important? Because, you know, the, the WHO pre-qualification of vaccines exists already since 1986. So it's not a new product. It's not a new service that WHO does. And it has pre-qualified 160 vaccines throughout all these years. And this facilitates two things. First, the UN procurement by UNICEF and PAHO. And second, it facilitates what we call the reliance mechanism. It facilitates that countries that do not have a, a strong experience in assessing vaccines uh, because they don't have production or whatever, you know, they can rely on WHO's assessment to do the to, to do an emergency use authorization or, or to allow entry into the countries. But WHO can only progress if it receives the information it needs from the companies. That's the call that we have. We have, um, we have the criteria for the assessment are internationally agreed criteria, and it does not differentiate whether it's a multinational manufacturer or a, a developing country manufacturer. These are agreed internationally criteria, and they were published last year as well. So we very much welcome that companies do provide the information according to this criteria that includes safety, quality, which you see in the, in the clinical trials, but also the good manufacturing practices. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simao. I would like now to invite Nina Larson from IFP Geneva to, to ask the next question. Nina? Yes. yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, okay, thank, you, thank you for the question. Um, uh, the pandemic appears to be slowing across the world, according to um, your latest epidemiological update. Um, how much of that uh, slowdown do you think is due to the vaccines that are out there now? And how much do you fear the new variants could uh, jeopardize that progress? Thank you. 
Thank you, Nina. You all looked at me to answer that question. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Nina, for the question. I think it's a good point to highlight the fact that we are seeing declines in incidents in a number of countries, and this is certainly good news. Um, this is due to a combination of factors, most notably the public health and social measures that countries are putting in. Um, it's about the tried and true, the tested interventions that we know work, that break chains of transmission, that prevent infections, that prevent those that are infected from passing it to someone else. Um, what we're seeing is that the use of active case finding, finding where the virus is, you know, using the testing systems that are in place, the PCR tests, the antigen-based tests that many countries are using now, and we hope mo more countries will start to use um, because these are easier to use and are, are welcomed in a number of different types of settings, making sure that testing is strategic, that results get back quick uh, to the two individuals so that public health actions can be taken, which include isolation of cases, good clinical care, making sure that patients enter the clinical care pathway and are assessed rapidly based on their need. And you heard from two amazing healthcare professionals about the importance of nursing and, and providing that care, that direct care to patients in need, making sure that our health workers are protected, they're trained, they are trained in caring for patients with COVID. They are protected with the vaccine. They are protected with personal protective equipment um, <clears throat> and that they are trained in optimized care for individuals. This also includes contact tracing. So of the individuals who are infected, um, we carry out contact tracing. So those who have come in contact with an infected individuals can have supported quarantine so that if they are to become infected, they can't pass the virus to somebody else. Um, it includes uh, governments and communities engaging and informing individuals about what they need to do. All of these different actions are really critical for breaking chains of transmission. Vaccines and vaccination are another incredibly powerful tool. Right now, the use of the vaccines are focused on those most at risk for severe disease and those most at risk for infection. And again, you heard from these health, health workers who are so happy to have been uh, vaccinated, but we need equitable vaccines around the world to ensure that health workers all over the world receive this vaccine. So it's a combination of factors of why we're seeing declines in incidence. But I think what is really critical is that countries that are reducing transmission continue to take all measures they can to drive down transmission. Um, individuals have a role to play in this with physical distancing that must continue, the wearing of masks, but making sure that when you wear masks, your hands are clean before you put them on. What, when you take them off, you dispose of those masks appropriately if they're single-use masks, making sure that you open windows, you avoid crowded spaces. All of these actions are driving down transmission, and all of these actions need to continue. It's a really critical period for countries that are having declined incidence. Um, that they stay the course and that they continue to, to adhere to these measures that are in place. And when appropriate, based on the data, based on the localized situation, open up very slowly and use this in a slow and a staggered way. Um, and so it's really important to stay the course. So there's a number of factors. There's no one solution, as you've heard us say many times. This includes the, the vaccine and vaccination. We keep saying do it all, and we mean to keep doing it all. Thank you, uh, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. I would like now to call on Care Simons, NBC, to ask the next question. Care, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, could I ask a couple of questions about the Origins investigation? One, housekeeping, if you like. Uh, you've published the terms of reference uh, last year on the investigation. But the latest terms of reference, uh, published, I believe, in January, are behind a password. Um, could I, I'm sure there's nothing to it, but could I just ask that somebody just uh, helps us by removing the password so we can see uh, the terms of the latest terms of reference? And then, more importantly, um, could I ask what you plan to publish at some point in the investigation? Uh, and um, could I ask for a commitment that you will ensure that you publish more details than just conclusions, what questions were asked, what tests were done, and what data was looked at? Thank uh, th you. Thank you, Kerr. Uh, I 
can answer the second part of the question. I, don't, I can't answer the first part of the question related to a password something, so we'll have to look into that because I'm not aware of anything online that requires a password. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to you on that. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Um, so the, the team is, as you know, um, finishing work, working uh, with Chinese counterparts and carrying out several different field missions. Um, they visited hospitals, they visited labs, including the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, they have been visiting several different centers for disease control at different levels, um, at the provincial level, the district level, for example, and they're having constructive discussions with their counterparts. There are many, many questions that are asked. Um, every question that is answered, there's always more questions uh, that are asked. Um, they are uh, looking at data and analyzing data together, um, and they will be working on a report. Um, after all of our missions, we always have a report. The contents of that report are being drafted by the international team members as well as the Chinese team members. Um, we don't have a, a view on that. Um, that needs to be done by the scientists who are in the field. Um, the terms of reference, as you saw, that were published outlined the suite of studies um, that are ongoing. Um, but as you can tell from that, there are a number of studies that will be done um, and you will, we will have some results, but that's just the start. There will be more studies that will need to be continued. Um, so it, the report itself will not provide all of the answers. Um, it, it was never intended to because that's just not possible, but it will provide a summary and a report of, of what was done during the mission and the findings of, of some of these early studies. Um, I think that's as much as I can say right now, um, and so we will provide that report uh, when it is available, as soon as it is available. Um, and just on that, uh, uh, um, there is no password associated with that, uh, with that link. Maybe the, the, the link is broken for, for you, and, uh, and, and I believe that uh, uh, the, on that web page a paragraph was added to the web part, but the terms of reference are there uh, as before. So if you have a problem, please contact our, our press team and they'll ensure that they help you through the process, but it's not a protected file, never has been. No, it wasn't care. Please uh, do send me an email uh, and we, we will uh, try to fix um, and to send you the, the right uh, way to, to open uh, the document. Thank you, Care. I would like now to call on Catherine Fionco Bokonga to ask the next question. Catherine, can you hear me? Yes, Fadela, perfectly. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening to all of you. Uh, I have a question regarding the use of vaccines. As there is a shortage of vaccines, certain countries have decided to use a combination of different products, meaning Moderna, Pfizer, Sputnik V, Sinovac. Is it a problem? And I would like to know how is, the, is organized the follow-up for the data, to gather the data about the use of products for side effects and other effects that have to be followed. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Dr. Swaminathan, you have the floor. Yes, I mean, I think that's an excellent question and there are a couple of elements to that. The first one is what is recommended and currently what is recommended is the second dose of the same uh, vaccine uh, and most countries are recommending that and WHO has uh, made, uh, SAGE has made recommendations for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and will do for the others as well. What's, what is important is to do the studies, the research to find out if you can actually uh, combine two different vaccines either using a same platform like a Pfizer and a Moderna both with mRNA or even more interesting would be to combine uh, two different platforms, so an inactivated vaccine followed by an mRNA or a, or a spike protein uh, vaccine. So these research studies are beginning uh, and it will take us some time to get those results. Um, meanwhile, we are aware that some countries have made in their guidelines the provision in very rare cases to be, uh, you know, vaccinated the second dose with a different vaccine, but that's certainly not the, the practice. Um, the WHO has had uh, several rounds of discussions on this. We hosted a big research um, seminar uh, with uh, 2,000 uh, people who attended about two weeks ago 
the idea was really to bring everyone together, you know, the developers and manufacturers as well as the scientists and academics working in the field to identify the big knowledge gaps and the priorities going forward. And questions like this were identified as top priorities, as was the question of what does one do with the variants, with the different variants, what are the assays that need to be done in the lab, what are the clinical studies that need to be done, what are the different designs. So the plan is very soon in the next few days to convene again, perhaps a smaller group, uh, particularly including the vaccine uh, developers, to agree on uh, what kinds of research studies need to be done to invite expressions of interest. Our uh, partner in COVAX, uh, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, has actually invited applications uh, from people who want to do research studies, but it would be a really good idea to coordinate that. And uh, we hope that, uh, you know, the WHO will play a role in actually bringing all of that evidence and data together. As we did for, for therapeutics, it will be important to really build that uh, platform and the knowledge for vaccines as it uh, accumulating rapidly uh, information about vaccines, both from the rollouts that are happening now in countries and observational studies, but also more randomized clinical trials are going to be needed to look at questions like the duration uh, and the gap between doses as well as the uh, combining different vaccines. And I, the feeling I get is that many manufacturers are actually quite interested in being partner, uh, participating in, uh, in, in a thing like this because I think that's for the future it would be important uh, for that data to be generated. So we will make it as inclusive and transparent uh, as possible. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. Um, I would like now to invite Tomo De Gucci from Kyodo News to ask the next question. Tomo, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Can you hear me well, Fadela? Uh, very well. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, question on Olympic Games in Tokyo. Um, the president of Tokyo 2020 organizing committee, Yoshio Mori, said that the Olympic Games will be held in Tokyo this year, no matter what happens, which means that he's not going to take into account how this pandemic unfolds in coming months. I'm sure WHO could see a great importance on a risk-based approach. And what is WHO's advice to the leader like Mori who makes such comments, not recognizing the situation based on scientific evidence and reality. Thank you. Thank you, Tomo. Dr. Ryan. Um, thank you. Uh, I know there is a, a collective desire around the world on everyone's part to, to move ahead with the Olympics. We've said it here before. It's a, it's a, it's a massive, an important symbol of unity and uh, solidarity around the world. Uh, what I do know is that the government in Tokyo, the organizing city, or the government in, of Japan, the organizing city of uh, Tokyo, and the IOC have been working diligently together. And I'm absolutely sure that they're taking every ounce of data uh, into consideration as they move towards the Olympics. We work with them in, and we input to their task force uh, on risk management, and um, we will continue to do so. Um, the decision to uh, host and continue with games is, is, is a joint decision of the, the host country and the International Olympic Committee, and I'm sure they will, they will engage. The desire to have the games is, is a laudable desire, uh, and the will to move forward <coughs> is a laudable will, but I am sure the government of Japan and all its officials will take all of their uh, data into account uh, as they move towards the games, and they will make... Uh, the correct decision on behalf of the, the people of Japan, uh, the athletes, uh, and potential spectators. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. I would like now to um, invite Isabel Sacco from EFE to ask the next question. Isabel, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Fadela. My question is on Ivermectrin. Uh, on treatment. Uh, this drug is being widely used in many developing countries as treatment to COVID patients and in several countries, for example in Latin America, is advised by the health authorities, even if uh, 
its efficacy is not uh, completely proved or its safety. So, um, and many, many people, plain people, is using this uh, ivermectin also as preventive. And so I would like to know what is the position of the show on this issue and when do you expect to have results from the trials involving ivermectin in the solidarity trial? Thank you. Isabel, uh, the last sentence was not very clear. It's okay? Yeah, yes, uh, uh, so my, the question uh, uh, regarding all that I said is that uh, I would like to know the position of the WHO show regarding the metrin and what, when do you expect to have results from the trial okay. that is involved in this drug in the solidarity trial? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Isabel. Um, Dr. Van Kerkop will yes. take this question. So I will start, and, and Sumia is going to answer the second part of that question. So um, currently, we haven't made a recommendation on the use of ivermectin, but we're closely following the research that is ongoing uh, related to this drug, um, which has shown some promising results in some trials uh, for the treatment of COVID-19. Um, we are aware that there's currently data av available of about 1,500 study patients, just slightly less than that, from 11 studies. Um, and there's data expected from up to more than 7,000 patients uh, in 56 studies. Um, and these studies are of varying quality. So we have a WHO steering committee that is tracking these studies and closely looking at them in order to trigger the guidance and when we have enough information to look at guidance and updating our guidance to change policy. Uh, this may begin in the coming weeks. So any of the changes um, that come from WHO recommended treatments follow an expedited but an incredibly comprehensive review, um, which is shared with the public, which will be shared with the public at the, at, at the earliest time that we can. Um, and so, do you want to cover the second part? Thanks. Yes, thanks, Maria. So, just to uh, clarify that ivermectin was not prioritized for inclusion in the solidarity trial. As you know, we have a oh. committee, an expert committee, that looks at uh, which drugs should go into the solidarity trial and. Current, currently, we're just in the process, actually, of finalizing the next set of drugs that would be tested in the solidarity trial, but ivermectin is not part of it. And just to add to what uh, Maria was saying, we have this process of the living guidelines update, which means that we're tracking all the developments in the treatment of COVID-19, the different clinical trials that are going on all over the world, and we do living updates of the meta-analysis. So as every trial gets completed, it gets added on and, you know, it adds to the weight of the evidence. And then the guideline development group actually looks at, uh, at the evidence and then makes the recommendations and then that gets updated on the living guideline platform. So they're, they're now looking at IL-6 inhibitors. They're looking at uh, an heparin-like, you know, anti-thrombotic agents. Uh, they're, they're looking at ivermectin uh, in the next couple of weeks and then at a few other drugs. So, you, you know, we, we'll keep updating the, the guideline, but it's really based on examining all the evidence from all the clinical trials. The problem is there are many small trials which sometimes give you misleading results and people get either very excited or very depressed about a, a, a result which is actually scientifically not valid. And so we have to be very careful when we interpret uh, results from these small trials and we need to really review the evidence as a whole. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, uh, very often in situations like this, and, and this is where we need all of science to work together, we often see observations when you'll see it written in the newspapers in vitro. You can demonstrate that a particular drug can kill the virus or inhibit the virus in vitro. That means in a test tube or on a dish. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean in a human body. Uh, and there are all kinds of, 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 of issues there. There are also astute clinicians over the years often observe that a drug that's been used in one disease for one indication can potentially be used in, a, in another. And they make observations on that and often they publish a, what's called a, a case study or a clinical series. And they publish and say, look, I've observed this, I've seen, I've treated a few patients, I think this might work. That's then often picked up and put into small scale clinical studies where you do prospective, you, you wait to get the patient, you use the drug and you collect your data. The difficulty we have um, with that situation is that can often, as, as Sumia said, lead to conflicting information. Many, many small studies, one says it might work, other says it don't. 
and what you need are large-scale clinical studies that can definitively answer the question. It doesn't mean the drugs are bad or good, it just means we cannot give it a, a definitive answer on that. But it is important to recognize too that all of these drugs, and you will hear people say, oh, these drugs are safe and they're well tolerated. Most drugs are, but all drugs have side effects. So therefore, it's really important that we have evidence that shows that the benefit of taking a drug outweighs, outweighs any risk of taking that drug. So the widespread use of a drug uh, on the basis of a hunch is not necessarily the best way forward. Mm -hmm. Having said that, it's really important that physicians and doctors and nurses are out there observing uh, because very often breakthroughs come from unusual observations. So we want to see that continue, but we also want to bring all of that data together in a way that it can drive uh, long-term policy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ryan. I would like now to call on Abdullah O'Hassan uh, from Morocco, Moroccan Media News. Abdullah, can you hear me? Abdullah? Naam, naam asma. Marhama. Shukran lakum ala ikhtiyar su'ali hada. Wa huwa kattali. لماذا لا يتم إنشاء وحدة لإنتاج لقاحات المعتمدة هنا بالمغرب ليكون بذلك مصدرا لحصول الدول الإفريقية النائية على اللقاح بشكل أسرع وتطعيم أسرع شكرا شكرا عبد الله um, so um, maybe maybe Dr. Simao uh, will answer and uh, عبد الله you have the translation too huh? Yes, th thank you very much, uh, Abdella, because this is a, a, a key issue as we fight this pandemic, is the, the need to increase manufacturing capacity in different parts of the world. So uh, your point is very well made. It depends a lot on, on the government interest and the investments that are needed, but WHO is pushing for uh, what we call the CTAP, which is a, a, a platform that will allow, allows for technology transfer, for licensing, uh, voluntary license of intellectual property, and that, and that also foster through the technology transfer the strengthening capacity at country level. Uh, let me say there is uh, a, one partner, one global partner with WHO on, on increasing manufacturing capacity, which is the Developing Countries Manufacturing Network. Uh, that comprises uh, manufacturers, I think 50 manufacturers in developing countries that can help also in this process. So, but it's, uh, your point is well made and it's, it's very important that we all, all countries make a stock take and uh, assess their capacity to, to technological capacity to receive technology transfer and also assess its, uh, uh, its legislation to allow for that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Simao. I would like now um, to call on Shane from CCTV to ask the next question. Shane, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Fadela, thank you. A question to Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kukov. So, identifying the zoonotic source of the virus is a complex scientific issue. A number of recent studies and reports have shown that clues to the existence of the virus have been found in human environmental samples preserved in multiple places in the world before December 2019. At present, an international expert team led by WHO is conducting the zoonotic source research with Chinese experts in Wuhan in China. Um, do you have plans to send similar expert teams to other relevant countries for global research cooperation on tracing the source as well? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shane. Thank you for the question. So there are a number of different um, uh, pieces of work that WHO is working on. You mentioned the wastewater. Um, I think you've probably heard me say before, in any situation, in any study that has been published, either wastewater studies or um, uh, sera or clinical samples that were collected and tested in 2019, we are following up on. Um, we are doing this through our international laboratory network. Um, and we are reaching out to the individual researchers directly. Um, we involve our regional offices as well. Um, and we're discussing with them the findings that they have, uh, whether these are 
preprint studies because some of the, the reports that you're mentioning actually have never been published um, in peer-reviewed journals, but we're, nonetheless, we're still following up with the researchers themselves to find out if we can do some further collaboration and further work um, if there are any remaining samples that exist um, and some follow-up. So there are a number of um, collaborations that are underway, um, but everyone that has been reported that we are aware of, we are following up directly with individual researchers. Um, thank you. Um, I think I will take a last question from Anne Gilland, The Telegraph. Anne, can you hear me? Anne? <coughs> Hi, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm muted. Um, <laughs> thanks very much for taking my question. Um, I had a question for um, Dr. Simao at the beginning um, in the answer to Helen Branzard's question. You talked about um, on January the 15th, and I presume you mean February the 15th, you're going to make an announcement about two vaccines. Um, is one of those the AstraZeneca vaccine? Is that correct, whether you're going to issue the emergency use license? Also, I just wondered why it's taken so long, because you've had the data for quite a long time. Thank you. Thank you, and, and apologies if I said it's February 15, our, our technical advisory group that will assess it, it has independent experts, meets in Geneva to assess two vaccines. One is the Serum Institute of, of India, which is a, an AstraZeneca vaccine, and the other is DSK Bio, which is also an AstraZeneca Bio uh, vaccine from uh, being produced in, in re the Republic of Korea. And actually, let me make it very clear, because we only received the dossier from the Serum Institute on the 15th of January. Okay, so we, we, don't, we didn't have this data for a long time. We received the full dossier for, for the India production in, in January 15, and last week, I think on the 29th of January, we received the last data for the AstraZeneca SK Bio. So there, there's a lot of, we, what we have is this rolling submissions. So this data only came to WHO a very few weeks ago, just to make this very clear. What we had beforehand was the AstraZeneca core data. You know, because you know AstraZeneca has eight manufacturing sites. Uh, we had, uh, I think, early in January, the, uh, the, the regulatory authority in the UK uh, assessing and, and giving a conditional use for some batches of the, the UK-based uh, uh, manufacturer. And then we have the EMA assessing the core data for the two European-based manufacturers. So what we do is the core data we assessed and it serves to all man, any, any of the AstraZeneca sites that will come to COVAX and uh, apply for WHO. But WHO needs for the COVAX facility needs to assess the SII, which is uh, produced, it's an S, uh, AstraZeneca uh, derived vaccine, but it has a different production site and also for the SK bio. So very clear that we only had this data very recently, the food dossier. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ryan, you have the floor. No, just before the DG takes the floor, I'm, I'm going back to the very first question that was asked, because I think it was a very pertinent question. We talked about, uh, you know, are we uh, turning, turning the corner? Um, well, the problem sometimes with corners is you don't see what's around that corner. Uh, and uh, this virus still has a huge amount of energy. Uh, it is a massive force of infection still associated with this virus. This is like a flood with water. And uh, just because the flood waters have dropped an inch or two, uh, it doesn't mean the flood's going to go away <clears throat> because it's still raining upstream. Um, and uh, from our perspective, communities around the world deserve huge credit. For the last number of weeks, compliance and buy-in and participation from communities and lockdowns and stay-at-home orders and wearing masks and, and avoiding crowded places, that's what's pushed the virus down. The virus hasn't gone, isn't going away by itself, and it won't. It will go away when we put it away, and communities deserve credit for that. It's been a tough number of weeks for people in many countries, uh, and it's beginning to pay off and adding vaccine into that equation is going to double and triple the payoff in the lives that we can save. But we have to follow through, and we have to continue to do everything to keep pushing that number down. Uh, remember what happened the last time someone said, <coughs> we're turning the corner. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike, uh, for that um, um, uh, intervention. I would actually like to add to that. I mean, since the vaccination started, as Maria said, could have some impact. Uh, but there are some observations from our data, uh, even before the advent or before even started the vaccine, where there are significant uh, declines in the number of cases and, and deaths. Uh, I would actually like uh, to bring one country, especially with very significant decline starting from September, and that's India. Um, in September, 14 September, the number of cases, weekly cases, was 646,000. And now, the week of 25 January, 91,000 per week. So from 646,000 to 91,000 is significant. So it was a constant uh, decline. Then not only cases, if you take the number of deaths, um, in September again, the week of September 14, the number of deaths per week was 8,166. Now, the week of January 25, it's 935 deaths per week. This is also very significant. So, continuous uh, decline. This shows us that if we can do the simple public health solutions, we can beat the virus. Now, with the uh, vaccination, uh, with the vaccines added, we would even expect uh, more and, and, and better outcome. Uh, but the decline actually started before the um, vaccines started. And this actually is a good news because with the vaccines added, the outcome could even be better. But for our advice, consistent advice to all countries is do it all. All the public health measures plus vaccine, better impact. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us today. And see you in our uh, next um, presser. Bon weekend. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, I remind journalists that they will be receiving the audio file and Dr. Tedros opening remarks right after this press conference. The full transcript will be available to you tomorrow morning on the WHO website. Um, so this press briefing is now over. Uh, thank you and a special thanks to journalists who are following us uh, very regularly.